From the Lean Enterprise Institute in Boston, this is the WLEI Podcast, where we share stories of people making the world better through lean thinking and practice. For more information about LEI, please visit lean.org. Hello, and welcome to the WLEI Podcast. I'm Tom Ehrenfeld, an editor at LEI. And today, we're really excited to be speaking with Dan Heath about his new book, Upstream, The Quest to Solve Problems Before They Happen. So, welcome to LAI, the the LAI podcast. Today, I am speaking with Dan Heath, author of Upstream, The Quest to Solve Problems Before They Happen. Uh, Dan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Tom. Great to be here. Thanks. So, let me start by asking you to tell us about your book. And I think that one of the best ways to start is there's a very short passage on the top of page 15. And I'd ask you to read that short uh, paragraph. Page 15. Okay, I'm, I'm flipping even as we speak. Here we go. It says, my goal in this book is to convince you that we should shift more of our energies upstream, personally, organizationally, nationally, and globally. We can and we should stop dealing with the symptoms of problems again and again and start fixing them. And if, you, if you'll indulge me, I think there's a short parable that, that opens the book that I think will help uh, clue the, the listener in as to, as to what this book is all about. And the, the parable goes like this. By the way, this is attributed often to a guy named Irving Zola, a sociologist. You and a friend are having a picnic by the side of a river And just as you're kind of laying out your blanket, getting ready to eat, you hear a shout from the direction of the river and you look back, there's a child um, thrashing in the river, apparently drowning. And so you both instinctively jump in, you grab the child, you bring them to shore. And no sooner have you done that, that you hear another shout and you look back, there's a second child in the river, uh, again, seeming to be drowning. And so you go back in immediately, you fish that child out. As soon as you get them to shore, there's two more children that are floating down the river in trouble. So you begin this kind of revolving door of rescue, and you're starting to get fatigued. And, and then you notice your friend swimming to shore and stepping out as though to leave you alone. And you say, hey, where are you going? All these kids are drowning. I, I need your help. I can't do it by myself. And your friend says, I'm going upstream to tackle the guy who's throwing all these kids in the river. And so that's the, that's the spirit of this book is, can we get out of the cycle of constantly reacting to problems uh, and go upstream and fix the, uh, the systemic issues that beget them? In the book, you, make it, you, you distinguish why you call it upstream as opposed to proactive or, uh, I, f- I forget what else. Why do you use- Preventive. Phrase, um, upstream. I think this, this metaphor of downstream versus upstream is really useful in that it prods us to think about the different circumstances and different timelines we could use. So just, just to be tangible, uh, I talk in the book about um, a kind of small problem that happened a few years ago. My parents had their home broken into, uh, the thieves uh, busted in their back door when my parents were out for a walk in the neighborhood and they came in and stole some iPhones and some jewelry and some other stuff. And, and the, the case was never solved. And so just as a thought experiment, I asked, how might we have prevented this burglary altogether? And when you start thinking in terms of upstream, you start realizing that, that, that you can go you know, a couple of inches upstream or you can go miles upstream. So, so to switch from from distance to a time metaphor, seconds before the burglary, if they had kicked in that back door and a deafening alarm had happened, that might have interrupted the burglary. Uh, Minutes before they came, maybe they noticed one of those uh, obnoxious signs in the front yard uh, of my parents that said, we're protected by this state-of-the-art security system. Maybe they would have just deflected to a neighbor's home. hours before. Maybe if they noticed a bunch of police out on the street, maybe that would deter them from trying anything that day. You could also go further upstream, though. If you start thinking months or or years before, maybe these are repeated offenders, and if they had been enrolled in certain kinds of behavioral therapy as a result of one of their previous offenses, 
maybe they would have been cured of this pattern of behavior and, and never done it. And then you can go very far upstream. Like there is um, a researcher named Richard Tremblay who spent his career studying how to reduce chronic aggression that, that often leads to crime. And his contention is the way to reduce aggression in children, especially males, is to pay attention to their mothers. And his research suggests that there's this whole cluster of risk factors that involve the time in which that future uh, aggressive child is in the womb. You know, things like maternal poverty and smoking and malnutrition and depression. And, and a, lot of things, a lot of these things are preventable. And so Tremblay's argument is, look, if we can create a healthier, more supportive environment for these pregnant mothers, the, the downstream payoff of that investment will be that when these kids hit their teenage years, they won't be aggressive and they won't commit crimes. And so, so just to kind of put a bead on this question, I think when we think in terms of, of upstream solutions, it's, it's, not, it's not an either or, it's not upstream or downstream. It's how far upstream should we go to make a wise decision on this particular problem? So it's a way of stretching the solution set, I guess is a crisper way to say it. I like that, stretching the solution set. Um, it also seems to be, to me, one of the strongest takeaways I got was <clears throat> a call to action for systems thinking, mm. for making connections between cause and effect that may not be immediately apparent, but which um, when you start to pull the boundaries back, absolutely correlate. And no question. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like finding interventions and building in um, forms of awareness that um, are that have leverage. I mean, you talk about leverage points. And um, it seems to me that with the systems approach, it's a systemic way, as it were, of finding the, the most effective uh, points of leverage and understanding their impact on a, a short term and then longer term and then even longer term um, basis. I think that's right. And I think uh, w one of the challenges I had in, in researching and writing this book is, I mean, there's so much that's been written and, um, uh, and considered with respect to systems thinking. Like, how do you, how do you make this clear to people who, who are not engineers, who are not systems thinkers, who are not lean thinkers, and I think part of it is even the basics of systems thinking, like distinguishing the part from the whole or, or anticipating kind of ripple effects from an initial action, I think can be really valuable. Like, like one of the stories that, that really landed with me was uh, I read about this situation where in New York City about a decade ago, there was a Google engineer walking through Central Park. And all of a sudden, he's struck by a falling oak tree branch and really badly hurt, ended up with brain injuries and was paralyzed. And, and you, you hear a story like that and you think, oh God, what a, what a horrible fluke injury. Except that later, the guy who's the controller of New York City, Scott Stringer, was analyzing a bunch of claims that had been filed against the city. And he comes across lots of examples of people being hit by falling branches. And he's thinking, what the hell is going on here? And he digs around and come to find out that, that the park's budget had been trimmed a few years prior, uh, and, and they had cut back on, the, on their pruning initiatives. And, and you come to find out, oh, gosh, so for the parks department, they were able to, to, to pare back probably as a result of some city initiative to save money. And they saved money, which was good for them locally. But the net effect of that was a lot of those branches that would have been pruned to keep things healthy ended up falling on human beings and causing lawsuits. And so uh, Scott Stringer's associate told me, whatever money we thought we were saving on the pruning side, we're ending up paying and then some on the lawsuit side. And I think those kind of systemic linkages are really difficult to see in big organizations. You know, we're, we're continually pushed to specialize, we're pushed into silos, pushed into functions. And all of a sudden, you start to, to do these things that, that optimize locally. Like for the parks department, treated independently from everyone else, maybe this is a great idea. But when you think about the system as a whole, 
you know, the, the impact of saving money in one spot was to take it out of a, of a different pocket and then some. And, and you end up with point optimization instead mm-hmm. of systems optimization. Exactly right. Yeah, that's, I'm not going to make this a big kind of call to lean, but I will point out that there's one of the reasons I invited you, and I'm just, again, really delighted and honored that you're, that you're here now, is that there's an enormous amount of overlap between what you're discussing and, and what I would consider some basic tenets of lean. Um, in fact, <laughs> one of our folks once consulted with a major hardware seller, and on their budget, they had a separate line item for falling inventory. they they stock their store so high and maintain them so poorly that they had a number that was built into the budget for injuries (laughs) and worse that were the result of injury of uh inventory tumbling off the top shelves oh i love that it reminds me uh, i was talking to um have you ever interviewed steve spear i I imagine he's uh, (laughs) yes absolutely He's written, he's, yes, he's a, he's a member of the LAI crowd. Yeah. And, and for listeners who may, may, may not be familiar, he wrote a great book called the high, high velocity edge about learning organizations, lots of lean content in there. I interviewed him uh, as part of this research. And I remember he told me the story of going to Harvard medical school and he asked the students what the normal rate of central line infections are. And for non-healthcare listeners, this is like w- when you need to put large volumes of fluids or medicine in a, in a patient, you uh, basically put a catheter in their chest. It's called a central line. And, and one consequence of that is if you don't do it with perfect hygiene, perfect procedure, you can introduce an infection. It's a really common problem, uh, albeit a preventable one. And so Scott Stringer was asking, or sorry, uh, Steve Spear was asking them, um, what's the normal rate of central line infections? And some of the students were kind of up on the literature. And so they were able to say, well, it's, you know, X for every thousand cases. And Spear said, well, no, that's, that's the rate today. That's an average of people's experience. But, but, but what is the, the normal rate? There's no such thing as a normal rate. There should be zero central line infections. You know, it, it, it's like the fact that something happens doesn't mean we should continue to allow it to happen, which, which is your story about the, the falling inventory line item. It's like the fact that we've done something stupid and allowed our inventory to hurt people, uh, it doesn't make it wise for us to budget that, budget for that in the future. What's wise is to say, hey, the appropriate rate of customer falling inventory injuries is zero, just as the appropriate desirable rate of central line infection errors is zero. And he, um, I didn't write about this in the book, but I kind of wish I had, is he had this beautiful quote. He said that the, uh, the instinct to change is often driven by an insufferable frustration with <laughs> the status quo. And I think that's true of so many different areas, uh, including healthcare. A lot of the people who started the, the quality work that led to a dramatic reduction in central line infections and other kinds of errors were people who just were absolutely fed up with the idea that we're accepting that, oh, well, you know, maybe one in a hundred patients gets a central line infection and, and that's just the way it is. And healthcare is a tough business. And they said, no, even one is too many. Uh, yeah. Anyway. No, that's, I went on a little tangent there, but I can't remember what the original question was. I just started thinking about Spear. It's, it's great. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to cover, but I'm going to j- just, just jump ahead to one where you talk about something you call upstream witchcraft. Mm. Basically stories of ways that folks found points of leverage, the kind of right place to intervene in order to improve future outcomes. And in fact, I'm going to quote your research and use an example from another Heath Brothers book called Decisive. Oh, nice. (laughs) And I'd say the story of Van Halen and the (laughs) M&Ms is just a perfect example of what you're calling upstream witchcraft 
Mm -hmm. uh, what Lean and Toyota might call pokey yoke, which is idiot proofing, mm -hmm. which has to do with building in mechanisms um, before accidents or mistakes happen. And the to uh, Toyota example I'd share is um, a string on their automated looms because before being a car manufacturer, Toyota was a um, textiles manufacturer. Oh, no kidding. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. And they adopted some of the ideas and principles from that when they became a uh, you know, uh, car, car maker. And it was a string that would break uh, when, when the loom was, oh my God, now that I'm <laughs> under pressure, I can't. It basically was automating the awareness of a critical failure mm. and alerting people in advance. So it's a I long. Think we got to we got to tell the Van Halen story. Please, you just, you just tease that, but you huh? can't leave the you can't leave people hanging. Tell Anytime me. there's a Van Halen story on a podcast, it's got to be told. That's just a rule. So give us the uh, context too. Sorry. Yeah, it's, I will. Okay, please. So, um, so David Lee Roth, of course, lead singer of Van Halen in the only era that mattered, the late seventies, early eighties. This is during uh, the "Running with the Devil," "Dance the Night Away," "Jump," "Panama," "Hot for Teacher" era. Uh, Van Halen. Can, can you name any of their songs? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a master, and and I'm a I'm a David Lee Roth uh, aficionado. The Sammy Hagar era is of no concern to me. In and any case, now that I've started a fight among your listeners. No, uh, just for the benefit of our listeners, too, Dan is a dead ringer for David Lee Roth. <laughs> give that or, is it. G give or take, uh, yeah, uh, about uh, uh, 80 points of good looks in his direction. Yeah. Um, but we are both white men, so that, that's what we have in common. Um, so during this era sorry, of Van Halen, last thing. Yeah, that's from a guy whose doppelganger is Stanley Tucci. So, <laughs> hey, I hadn't thought about that. You're right. I like that. <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. Okay, can I finish the story or not, Tom? Please. All right, here we go. So, uh, so Van Halen in those days was doing you know a hundred road days a year, a hundred shows a year. And they were known for bringing really sophisticated technical productions to even small markets. You know, they would show up in Chapel Hill, North Carolina with like uh, multiple 18 wheelers full of gear. And, and because it was so sophisticated, they published this technical writer, hundreds of pages about how to set up the show for them. Because of course, they're just going to pull up drunk in the tour bus and be ready to play, right? Well, there was some danger associated with this because this was the same era when there had been some public stages that collapsed uh, for big shows and artists were hurt. This was the same era when Michael Jackson got his hair caught on fire in that Pepsi commercial because some pyrotechnics weren't set up right. And so the fear that Van Halen always had was, how do we know if we're going to get to a show and you know some yahoos have have set things up right or sorry set them up wrong and that exposes us to risk of injury. Well, turns out um, during the same era, there was this rumor that spread about the band, this kind of nasty rumor that in their contract, they required there to be a bowl of M&Ms put backstage with all of the brown ones picked out. And the way this rumor circulated, people were horrified by this because they thought, gosh, what a diva-ish thing to do. Like just because you're this rich, famous rock band, you're putting these provisions in and now some you know, poor roadie backstage in Chapel Hill is like going monotonously through the M&M bowl. Uh, but it turns out this was a tripwire for Van Halen. The first thing they would do when they show up drunk in Chapel Hill is march backstage, look for the bowl of M&Ms, see if there was even one brown M&M in the bowl. And if there was, they would demand a technical line check of the entire production. Because David Lee Ross said, look, if they are willing to, to put the entire show at risk, I should have mentioned that uh, uh, one part of that M&M clause was that if any brown M&Ms were found in the bowl, uh, the band would get paid and the entire show would be forfeit. So David Lee Ross said, if they're willing to risk the entire show over a bowl of M&Ms, they clearly haven't read the, the technical writer and they haven't paid sufficient attention to ensure that we stay safe. And I've always loved that vision of David Lee Roth as an operational genius 
you know, that he was smart enough to anticipate uh, problems before they happen. And, and weirdly, Tom, I have to tell you just as a sidebar to the story, uh, I mean, it's almost uncanny that you picked this out because when I first started collecting research on what became this upstream book, it was in 2009, and that story was the first item in the file. The first, no joke. The parable that I told earlier was the second, by the way. Um, so, so it's kind of weird that you called back to this thing that was actually part of the, the genesis of the project. Um, it just brings to mind a very relevant quote from Spinal Tap. <laughs> which, We're covering all the classics today. <laughs> there's such a fine line between clever and stupid. <laughs> yes. And seen. <laughs> no, let's. So let me shift gears. Uh, there's a really interesting quote in the book um, uh, on page 63 that says, The need for heroism is usually evidence of system failure. And basically, you talk about how thinking upstream kind of obviates the need for heroes that heroism is kind of anathema to good upstream thinking. Um, can you talk about that? Absolutely. If, if you think about the way we conceive of heroes, our schema of heroes, we're thinking of people who rush in when there's an emergency, you know, the, the firefighters uh, who put out the flames in a burning building or the, the lifeguard who jumps in a pool to, to save the drowning kid or a policeman who come to fight off a, a burglar or whatever. But what I want to point out is that an even better kind of hero it's, is someone not that saves the day, but that keeps the day from needing to be saved. And, and we do this weird thing in organizations where we reward um, unnecessary heroism. You know, the, the, the times in organizations when colleagues are staying up all night to finish the critical grant application or to make sure the, the software release cycle goes off and... Um, you know, we, we always hold these people up. I've, I've had a, a couple of um, conspiratorial readers uh, email me and say that they've been in organizations where they actually suspected that people kind of created fires on purpose for the sake of being the one that was able to put it out and getting the glory. And so that's what I mean when I say, you know, the need for heroism is often or, or is usually a sign of, of systems failure. Because if you think about I'll give you a tangible example for this book. I, I didn't end up writing about this, but the YMCA um, is is obviously a, a, a hugely prevalent organization nationally. More people swim in YMCA pools than anywhere else. And they've done a lot of work over the years to prevent drownings. And if you think about uh, what that work looks like, it's it's real boring incremental stuff. It's you put the lifeguard's chair a little closer to the pool to ensure that there's no visual blind spots. And you teach them techniques of scanning the pool so that they, they scan the entire pool visually every 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. And you make sure they don't have access to their cell phone uh, in, the, in the lifeguard chair just to make sure there's no distractions. And you rotate them so they don't get bored, just like a TSA agent at the airport and on and on. And it's these process improvements that make all the difference and, and then if you ask, well, who's the hero? To me, there are a lot of heroes, but, but none of those people ever got any glory. None of the process consultants, none of the trainers, none of the lifeguards that changed their behavior. I mean, the net effect of all that work is that nothing happens. Yeah. But nothing happening is a wonderful thing. I mean, everybody that's got a child should be delighted that nothing happens. But it's just kind of this, this glory asymmetry that I think is a really interesting wrinkle in thinking about downstream versus upstream work. Well, it's, sorry, it's absolutely counterintuitive and it kind of cuts across, across the grain culturally mm -hmm. that we just have a bias to kind of celebrate heroic interventions, heroic individuals. Um, so, um, 
And I should be clear. I mean, look, if my child was drowning in the pool, I mean, I, I, I would be deeply, deeply grateful for the person to come in and save the day. It's not that I'm being dismissive of, of the downstream heroes. It's just that what we should aspire to is a society where we need fewer of them, you know, because the systems work the way they were supposed to work. I mean, in, in our current, when we recorded this, we're right in the middle of the coronavirus uh, era. And so this is, all of these themes are kind of fresh in mind. Well, I was holding back on that. Let's, let's shift gears. How does upstream uh, relate to uh, current days? You even have a book, a chapter in the book about preparing for kind of uh, black sheep, black sheep events. In, in, in the book, you talk about um, preparing for Katrina, but I'm going to leave this open-ended. You know, your book is essentially about ways to think about problems before they occur. And yeah, I, I, no, go ahead. No, it's, it's, again, it's open-ended. How do, how do, how, based on what you kind of learned and reflected on from the book itself, what do you think about the situation today where, you know, it's, it's, it's mid late March, we're dealing with a crisis, the global pandemic. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to work backwards and find blame points because that's been done. Yeah. But yeah. What, I, what, what do you, what, how, do, how does the stuff that you learned um, apply? It's a great question. So l let me kind of zoom out because I'm not a pandemic expert. If you're listening, you know, close to when we recorded this, uh, I don't have any tips about social distancing that are going to be relevant. What I think I can add is a perspective on how does something like this, this being a pandemic, which is entirely foreseeable, people that are experts in public health have been warning about uh, pandemics for literally decades. How does this seem to kind of catch us by surprise? And I think that, that maybe an analogous experience related to uh, the preparations for Hurricane Katrina. So I, I uncovered something in researching the book that, that I was never aware of before. I always just thought of Katrina as being one of the most grotesque failures of government action in, in recent memory. And, and to be clear, it still is, but I think you might look at it a little differently after hearing this. So, uh, Back in 2004, so Katrina was in 2005. In 2004, one of the top executives in FEMA uh, had had hired a contractor to work on what he thought was the single most troubling kind of natural disaster scenario on his radar, which was a serious hurricane in New Orleans. So exactly the right problem. So this contractor, which is called IEM, they put together a simulation. Of, of a really bad hurricane. They called it Hurricane Pam. And they assembled in 2004, all the right parties to kind of go through the simulation and figure out how would we respond? How would we collaborate? What kind of supplies would we need? Where would we get them? I mean, they had all the right state agencies. They had the federal agencies. They had the city people. They had politicians. They had academics. It was a beautifully designed exercise that really surfaced a lot of the things uh, that, that they would need to envision for the emergency when and if it came, if at that time. Of course, it, it came in real life a year later. Uh, so, so this was the first in what was planned to be a series of planning, uh, planning slash simulation exercises to get them ready for the big one. Well, what happened was after that first Hurricane Pam simulation, uh, FEMA apparently balked at paying travel costs for the remaining regimen of the training simulations, uh, the costs were estimated to be about uh, $15,000 for employees. A year later, Katrina happens and the federal government went on to spend more than $62 billion in supplemental sp spending for uh, rebuilding the Gulf Coast. And there's something about that story that kind of just says it all, right? That, that $15,000 was balked at for a problem that would eventually cost us $62 billion. And, and look, it's not that FEMA could have prevented Hurricane Katrina. There's no preventing a hurricane, at least at this point. But it says something about 
the, 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 you know, back to this idea of asymmetry between downstream and upstream, when something bad happens, it demands action. I mean, there was no one in the government that was saying, well, uh, let's be careful how we act after Katrina. Everybody wanted to help. Everybody wanted to rebuild. It's spend, spend, spend. Money is no object. No one was watching the dollars at that point. But beforehand, it's like all of these things become discretionary. You know, well, should we be spending on these simulations? And, you know, th there hasn't been a, uh, a catastrophic hurricane in New Orleans for many years. I mean, don't we have other priorities? And is it worth $15,000? And, uh, and, and this is something that, uh, that surprised me uh, about this upstream versus downstream tension is that downstream work tends to be demanded and even obligated. You know, when, when someone shows up in the ER and they need heart surgery, there's no discussion of whether to do it. When a, a, a toddler soils themselves in daycare, there's no discussion of whether to change the diaper. Downstream action is, is obliged. But upstream action, despite how big the stakes are, is often voluntary. It's often optional in a weird way. I mean, it requires someone to kind of step up and say, by God, we're doing this. That didn't happen with Katrina, and it didn't happen with preparations for pandemics. Uh, I mean, it's not that nothing happened. We've been building in public health better and better surveillance systems, better communication systems for, for many decades. But it's very, very clear. I mean, if you ask the top experts on pandemics, did, did, did you have the things that you thought were most important to prepare us for this moment? Did you have funding to make sure those things were working and operational and tested? The answer is going to be no. Why? The same reason FEMA said no to $15,000, because there was always something more urgent at the moment that seemed to require downstream action. And that starved us of the attention we needed to prevent uh, what we're enduring right now with the coronavirus. And yeah, and I think it's hard to prioritize actions for threats, mm -hmm. for people to decide which tangible preventative measures to, to take. Um, but yeah, I, I do mean, think, I think it's, it's ambiguous and I think it's complex but I don't think it's um, unsolvable. Like, like a telling part of that Katrina story to me is, you know, this, this top administrator at FEMA was asked, hey, what's the thing that keeps you up at night? And he said, a catastrophic hurricane in New Orleans. You know what I mean? There, there, were, there were lots of threats. It was complex. It was ambiguous. But he was still able to triage and say, of all the scenarios, the one that really bugs me because of the natural geography of New Orleans, is this. And he was dead on right. And I think the same thing is true. I mean, there's lots of, of talk of existential threats to humanity, ranging from asteroid collisions um, to AI taking over the world to pandemics. But I think if you'd canvassed, you know, the, the world's top 100 public health leaders, and you'd said, what's the number one threat we should be preparing for? My guess is, pandemics would have been one or two on that list. Um, so, so I don't think the difficulty of forecasting is, is, is a good excuse for, for the lack of preparation. Yeah. Um, let me ask you to comment on what, it, it's a little anticlimactic, but there, there was one interesting quote in the book um, from Maureen. But Bissonniero from the local Institute for uh, Healthcare, IHI, I forget. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement, yeah. Improvement. Founded, by the way, by Don Berwick. Yeah. Yet another lean zealot who helped Jim Womack set up the Lean Enterprise Institute. Oh, is that right? I didn't know that. Yeah. Gosh, Don Berwick is like just, um, I consider him such a hero. Talk about an upstream hero. Yeah. Earlier, we were talking about, um, um, you know, central line infections and, and errors. And, and I feel like that's one of Don Berg's greatest legacies is, is the fact that he and the IHI kind of shook awake uh, the healthcare system in this country to 
the danger of preventable errors. I mean, at, at one time, and it still may be true, I'm not sure. At one time, preventable errors were one of the 10 largest sources of deaths in the U.S. I mean, that's how big of a deal this was. Um, and the IHI for, for many, many years has just relentlessly gotten people focused on quality and gotten people to reject this idea that just because something happens doesn't mean it's normal, that it, it, one central line infection is one too many. But anyway, sorry, to go ahead with your question, Tom. Uh, no, just one interesting. It reminds me of Ralph Nader. Whatever your opinion of him, I've read that the number of deaths during the time of the Vietnam War by people who would have survived if they had had seatbelts mm -hmm. exceeded the number of people who died in the Vietnam War. I would, I would believe that. Yeah. So the, I'm just saying the material impact of that type of upstream thinking, it, 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 it really, it has a big impact. Um, Maureen, you quote Maureen um, about being patient for action, but patient for outcomes. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what, what you mean by that? What she means by that? I think what she's trying to say is when, when we get in, really thorny, complex problems. Uh, for instance, asthma, the, uh, the youth asthma. So the healthcare system that we've got today is very well equipped and very efficient at handling asthma downstream. Your kid comes in with asthma, we've got all the tools and medications and uh, behavioral processes you need to manage that and to reduce your, your symptoms. That's what we're great at. If we start talking about going upstream and preventing asthma, which in many cases is preventable, then it gets very, very messy because then you're talking about issues of hunger and subpar housing and lack of access to health care and uh, the ability to, to monitor uh, a patient over time reliably. And, and, and that's, that feels uncomfortable to people in the healthcare system. I mean, they were trained to diagnose and treat, not to, you know, uh, worry about what kind of housing their patients are coming from. So I think what Maureen is trying to say is, is when you get involved in uh, an effort like trying to prevent asthma or, or trying to prevent homelessness or trying to prevent school shootings, we need to, to have the the hunger to act, we need to be doing something. But the systems are so complicated and the causation is so uh, uncertain or unproven that it may take a long time for us to figure out what the right leverage points are. And so when she says, be impatient for action, but patient for outcomes, I think she's just cautioning a kind of, um, uh, of resilience that, that we need to keep our eye on, on the good that we're trying to do for the world and we need to accept that the world's very, very complicated. But we also can't allow that to slip over into a feeling of helplessness, that, um, that we owe the world action. Uh, and, uh, and so I thought that was a, a very powerful sentiment. I've had some people push back on me, by the way, for that idea. And I think probably many of the listeners that, that do great lean work might push back because I think lean is a, is a set of tools that often can provide quick payoff. Uh, you know, even in listening to some of your podcasts, you know, I was struck by people talking about these quick wins that they got that kind of bought uh, enthusiasm for lean thinking. And so I think it, it just varies, you know, it, it varies on what weight class of problem are we tackling? And I think the problems in the, in the, the highest or heaviest weight class uh, probably require more patience than some of the more operational challenges. Yeah, and as you show in the book, often the outcomes are kind of iterative. Mm -hmm. uh, it just, it's hard to diagnose ahead of time the kind of metabolism of change that'll take place. And sometimes focusing on mic micro, not macro, cumulatively forms bigger, broader, deeper change in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, you're bringing up what to me was one of the most interesting tensions that, that emerged from, from this research. And that is 
on one hand, as we talked about earlier, to fix problems, a lot of times you got to fix systems. And that's really complicated and kind of high level systems redesign. On the other hand, again and again, in some of the, the success stories that I discovered, they were using an, an approach that looks at first glance very different than systems change. Like, I'll, let me sketch out a, a, a quick story so I can show you what I mean. There's a story in the book about Rockford, Illinois, the second biggest city in Illinois behind Chicago. Uh, there was a mayor a couple of years ago named Larry Morrissey, who was in the ninth year, I think he was in his third term, ninth year in office. He'd been working on homelessness the whole time. So Rockford's one of these places that had a manufacturing base and then the man manufacturing businesses shut down. And so there was a lot of challenges in the community, a lot of veteran homelessness in particular. He'd be working on that, or he had been working on it for nine years. No real effect. They'd just been treading water at best. Within 10 months of something happening, Rockford became the first city in the U.S. to eliminate the problem of veteran homelessness. So the question is, what was the thing that happened? And what happened was they encountered uh, a movement that is reframing the way cities handle homelessness. And I'll, I'll just give you a, a quick sketch of the, uh, the changes that are involved. The first change is, as with many problems, both inside organizations and, and across organizations, homelessness is plagued by silos. So, you know, you look in any particular community, there's a dozen different organizations or even systems that have some stake in the problem. There's the VA, there are homeless shelters, there are social service agencies, there's the healthcare system, there's the police, and all these people touch homelessness as a problem. They all have a stake in it, but there's no clear coordination behind it. So the first change that happened was all of these constituents were brought together for the first time to really focus on the issue of homelessness. But the second part I think is perhaps even more profound. And, and that was a change in what they were being asked to do. You get 12 different organizations or systems reflected in the same room, you're gonna very quickly enter a pontification fest. You know, if you ask them, how can we fix homelessness? I mean, that's a recipe for two hours of fruitless discussion. What they did was they started keeping a, a census, a real-time census of all the homeless people in Rockford. I mean, I saw this thing. It was a Google Doc. And it was like, number one was Steve, and number two was Fred, and number three was Michael. And as part of the census, they monitored what their circumstances were, what their history was, their current location, uh, how vulnerable they were to, uh, to being seriously hurt. Many of them have health conditions. And when these people would get together across these different organizations, what they were talking about was going name by name through the list. So the discussions would be, okay, Steve, who, who saw him this week? Well, we saw him. He was still in his tent under the bridge, but he's been coming into the homeless shelter to get lunch every day. Housing. Okay, housing folks, how, how quick or, or how, how long will it be until we have some housing for Steve? We've got a unit that just opened up yesterday. Okay, who's going to make the approach to Steve and make sure he's ready to be housed? That was the nature of the conversation. Notice how concrete that is. Right? You're not talking about homelessness as, a, as an issue or as a uh, political challenge. You're talking about what can we do for Steve this week? And, and that was the engine of how they managed person by person, situation by situation, to eliminate the population of veteran homeless. They were, they were all housed within that first year. And so, so back to that tension I was highlighting, yeah. I think that, that macro change often starts with micro change, that we can't really figure out how to help a thousand people or a million until we can help one, until we can help two, until we can help three. And I think what these groups figured out was, you don't know what the leverage points are in the system until you've solved for one and solved for two. Because what you start to understand in dealing with these on a case-by-case -case basis is where the dropped uh, batons are and where the systemic issues are. And so it's almost like getting that close to a problem and, and I know all the lean uh, light bulbs are going off right now. You're like, we've been saying this for years, and I get it. Uh, getting that close to the problem opens up doors that you wouldn't have spotted otherwise. Yeah. And 
breaking it down in, you know, what is the problem we're trying to solve? And then kind of framing that in a, an, in an improvable way. Mm -hmm. That makes a ton of sense. Um, let me ask one final question because you've been really generous with your time. Um, I'm going to point out to our listeners that you've written a, a number of really excellent books prior to this with, with brother Chip hmm? called Decisive about making better decisions, um, a book called Switch about how to switch. And let's harken back to your first one, Made to Stick which was just a, a phenomenon and a book that successfully practiced what it preached um, and managed to kind of capture the attention of a large number of people and communicate its ideas in a very pithy and let's say it sticky way. Hey, and this is how we met. Of yeah. Course. Just a little behind the scenes talk for the listener. Tom and I met at a, uh, at a boot camp hosted by a, uh, a business book retailer called uh, 1-800-CEO-READ, since rebranded to Porchlight Books. And so it was like a collection of nervous business authors uh, that that's all got together. Re that's a little redundant. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> business authors uh, yeah. all together in the same room. And um, Jack Covert and, um, uh, oh God, isn't it Todd Satterston? His name slipped my mind for four seconds. Um, we're, we're kind of hosting us and, and teaching us what this is going to be like. And, you know, how do you publish a book? How do you market a book? How do you think about speaking engagements? And it was, it was such a wonderful kind of impromptu community. I, I still remember it fondly 12 years later or whatever it is. Um, and, and anyway, you were there talking about writing. Yeah. What do I know? Um, <laughs> What uh, what do you what would you apply from made to stick to this book? In in other words, what are the kind of ideas about sharing ideas that you're trying to practice with um, upstream? Well, I, I'll I'll share my my dirty secret about this book, which is um, I think that just the basic language of upstream downstream is is one of my top goals in publishing this book because I think it simplifies a bunch of stuff that can be very, very complicated. Um, you know, th th there are these kind of micro ecosystems that all have their own jargon, you know, among them lean and six Sigma and quality improvement and continuous improvement. And everybody uses kind of different labels and um, different uh, exotic terms. And, and I think that the heart of it is really just to contrast the reaction mode, which is what I'm calling downstream and, and uh, prevention mode, which is upstream. Um, that's kind of, it, if, if people get nothing else from my book, then the ability to go to the boss or the person that has the budget strings and just you know, be able to, to use that schema to make things a little bit simpler, a little bit easier to understand. That's a first pass victory for me. Uh, so, um, so that's that's one way I would link that first book about sticky ideas to this one is sometimes um, words can can have a disproportionate importance that that if we can share a common language about change or or a common language about um, what improvement looks like that can be surprisingly important just to talk about things in the same way and to view them through the same lens. Uh, and, and so I'm hoping that this upstream versus downstream distinction becomes a kind of leg up for uh, a lot of the people like all of you listening to this podcast right now who are already believers in this stuff uh, to, to broaden your, your alliances and to broaden the base of people who think this work is critical. That's fantastic. So talking to Dan Heath, whose new book is titled Upstream. The quest to solve problems before they happen. Um, Dan, before I let you go, tell us where people can read more about your book and download your wonderful uh, resources, the study guide. Yes. So you can go to uh, upstreambook.com 
And, and then uh, there are some resources available on the site that are free. You just have to sign up for our, our newsletter that we lazily publish about three times a year. Uh, but it's all there for the taking. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks, Tom. It was fun. So as a PS, um, Dan has a further message to share. I was just talking to Tom offline and I was thinking for anybody who has listened to all 50 minutes or whatever of this conversation, you are, you are my people. You're who I wrote this book for. And, and I would love to get a copy in your hands and I'm, I'm even willing to put my money where my mouth is. So here's the offer. The first 100 people who hear this and email me at dan at heathbrothers.com. That's Heath, like Heath Ledger, H-E-A-T-H, uh, with your mailing address and, and an asterisk here. I can only do U.S. addresses. I know uh, there's people from abroad that are going to hate me for saying that. I'm sorry. It's just a function of my, my books that come from my American publisher and the expense and blah, blah, blah. So I'm sorry to those outside the U.S. But if you have a U.S. address that I can mail to, send it to me at dan at heathbrothers.com. The first hundred people to reply will get a free copy of Upstream. No strings. Uh, hope you enjoy that that offer. Thanks, Dan. This is the uh, brown M and M test as well. Exactly right. See, <laughs> see how many people nodded off at minute twenty-eight. <laughs> okay. I want to thank Dan Heath for sharing his time with us, for his uh, great imagination and ideas, and especially for his generous offer to share free books with those who reach out to him. Um, this podcast is produced with Lori Moniz and Emma Ripp. I want to thank them. And above all, um, I want to thank you, our listener, for listening in. Please share any questions, suggestions, or improvements to pod, P-O-D, at lean.org. Thanks again.